appreciate that, brother. And it's my turn to return the compliment. I appreciate Brother Guyton. I appreciate him keeping me in his mindset as when he came here and he had some ideas about where he wanted to take the school, the technology that he was going to implement. And, uh, and he called me uh, one afternoon, uh, uh, shortly after my father's passing, about three months. And, uh, and we had lunch. He told me about the online class, what he had in mind as far as that goes. And, uh, and I appreciate him very much for that opportunity to be part of that and to be part of the school again. And of course, I appreciate uh, uh, Guyton and, uh, and the vision he has for the school. And uh, there are a lot of things, technology speaking, that uh, technologically speaking, that he has uh, uh, implemented since he's been here and appreciate the elders and financing the things that he did because I think it's going to be for the greater good. And I appreciate uh, everyone very much, Guyton, the elders, and all those who uh, are behind this work. Did I say that right, Guyton? Okay. Actually, I said that out of my own free will, and he talked about what a pushover I am. But, uh, you know, I think when I, I studied about uh, John Calvin and learning more about this man and his personality, uh, he was asked by city officials when he was enjoying life in Strasbourg, Germany, to come back to Geneva. And uh, he really did not want to do that. In fact, he made a statement he said, I would rather face death a hundred times. But then he said this, if I had a free choice, I would prefer doing anything else in the world. Think about this man's theology. He believed that he was the, I don't want to say victim, but he believed that he was somebody that was brought along by circumstances, by people, because he believed that whatever interaction he had in life, that God had put that in in his place, and that he felt that he did not have the right to, uh, to disappoint anybody. And I think this, this goes back to, uh, of course, his upbringing. And uh, he actually was uh, an individual that, uh, as according to uh, Durant, he uh, was, grew up in an ecclesiastical city. Now, the you wonder what an ecclesiastical city, if you, it is a city that is basically run by the Roman Catholic Church. And, uh, and it was dominated by its cathedral and its bishop. And here at the outset, he had an example of theocracy, a rule of society by the clergy, uh, men in the name of God. And of course, uh, this had somewhat to do with his upbringing and the intimidation, no doubt, that he felt daily based upon that. And the fact that his father uh, was one who was a legal advisor to the cathedral, and he served in other administrative capacities under Charles de Hanks, who was a bishop there in Noyon. And uh, so when we think about him and, and maybe have our mindset go back to this particular time, imagine being a, in a city that is controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And that whatever happens there is at the behest of that. And uh, so this is, is his introduction in life. This is what he grew up in. Now, when we think about his family, and, and of course, when we think about his name, uh, John Calvin, that is our American anglicized pronunciation. His name was actually Jean Calvin. And uh, in fact, uh, at one point when he uh, had uh, studied uh, Latin, he actually put his name down while he was going in Paris when he went to school there as Ionis Calvinus, which is his name in Latin. He excelled in that in college. But he was born in Noyon, uh, France, in, in the Pic Picardy region. That would be like a province in northwestern France on July 10, 1509. And when you think about his, his family, again, we mentioned his father. His name was Gerard Calvin. His mother, uh, Jean Lafranc, that's her, that was her maiden name. Uh, she was actually the daughter of an innkeep innkeeper from Cabrai, which is uh, in modern-day Hauts de France region. She was a devout Catholic, known for her 
piety and her beauty, uh, beauty, and she actually died when Calvin was only four or five years old. He had two brothers. Charles was the oldest, and Antoine was the youngest. Now, Antoine, uh, uh, and of course we read later on, he became involved in Calvin's life. I, I don't know if we'll get to that part of it because we have so much to cover in this, and I'll keep it in the allotted time. Uh, but we, his brother Charles actually ended up being uh, excommunicated. He died as a heretic and uh, refusing the sacraments, according to uh, Will Durant, who wrote concerning this. And we think about uh, the fact that uh, his father, upon the death of his wife, Jean, remarried, and uh, Calvin did not get along with his mother, his stepmother. And uh, as a re result of that, there was friction in the household. Now, it came around this time where uh, Gerard noticed that uh, John, or Jean, had a quick mind and a tenacious memory. And he recognizes the fact that this man, this young man has the ability to be scholarly uh, in nature. And of course, uh, it was common at that time where if you had a middle class family who sh had a child that showed promise the way he was showing, that he was actually put in the home of a more wealthy family, and in this case, the Montmores in, uh, in Noyon, and they would finance his education to a certain extent. And this is what uh, happened here. Now, we know Calvin, uh, according to uh, Wiley, a historian, stated that he received a more thorough classical grounding and a acquired a polish of manners to which he would have never uh, had under his father's humble roof by hanging out with the more upper crust of society, I guess we could say that. And we also know that uh, in May of 1521 that he, at 14 years of age, or well, about 12 years of age, uh, 14 is when he actually went to pre-college, uh, pre but uh, he was appointed to the chaplaincy uh, attached to the altar of Legacine, which is in the Cathedral of Noyon, and he received a tonsure. And, of course, the tonsure is, you've seen the haircuts. I think they had pictures of, uh, of uh, Luther, who may have had a haircut of that nature, where it resembles the crown of thorns that Jesus wore, where you bald on the top and you had the hair around that. And apparently that was indicated, indicative of religious piety and humility in the individual that wore such. Uh, but then we have him going to... Uh, uh, college in uh, 1523 at four, uh, 14 years of age. Now, this was a, a pre-college where he would study things to prepare him for actual, uh, actually going to college, where he studied grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. This was the College de la Marche at the University of uh, Paris. And, of course, it was while there that he changed his name to Ionis Calvinus. And, of course, uh, it's interesting that uh, his father later on uh, had, as he uh, had, was attending the College de Montague, he remained there until 1528. And uh, his father insisted in 1528 that he study law in Orleans. Now, we call it Orleans. It would be Orlan, I guess, in French. And that's where France's best law f uh, facility was located or, and there, had their uh, best faculty there. His father had had a falling out with the church uh, officials in Noyon, and even though he had desired to begin with that all three of his sons get into the priesthood and was actually encouraging Calvin in that direction, because of this falling out, we find that he uh, changed his mind about his son following a spiritual path having to do with the, the church, uh, the Catholic church. In fact, uh, Durant stated Gerard himself was excommunication communicated after a financial dispute with the cathedral chapter and had some trouble getting buried in holy ground after his death because of this dispute. And Calvin observed, and this was kind of humorous to me, he said that his father's directive was probably because he judged that the science of laws commonly enriched those who followed it. So he, he probably wanted more uh, income for this young man, and if he had continued to live or uh, trickle down, if you, if you will. Now, while he was in Orleans, or Orlan, he threw himself into his law studies, and he, was, he so impressed the faculty there 
that he uh, became so astute in learning the law that he would often teach classes for professors who were absent. And this shows uh, an impressive uh, aptitude uh, for John Calvin at this time. And while he was there, he continued his study in, at the University of Bourget, and uh, he continued his studies in law there, and then he came in contact with those involved in, in, in the Renaissance, a humanist lawyer, and, and Andrea Alciato, and, uh, and of course he was influenced by the humanism propagated by Erasmus and, and others. And this left an indelible mark on Calvin, and again, raised in an ecclesiastical city where he was under the thumb of the Roman Catholic Church, and here he is branching out and learning more about the world around him. Uh, and while there, he began, began studying the scriptures in their original language, Hebrew and Greek, and of course, also in Latin, which, in which he had uh, excelled, and he earned his degree in law in 1531. Now, his father died the same year. And although this was a sad occasion for him, it actually freed him to strike out on his own academically. He could do what he uh, wanted to do as far as that goes. Now, we want to consider looking at the events that led him to become a reformer. And, of course, this would cover the years 1531 to uh, 1533. Now, he returned to Paris to study, continue his studies at the College de Montague, and at this time, the Reformation was making inroads into the thinking of the student body. And uh, we find that there was a group of students who went by the name of the Gospelers who were actually those influenced by the Luther Reformation at, at this point. He, and he initially had nothing but disdain for them because he was still tied and loyal. He considered himself a son of the Roman Catholic Church, and he strongly opposed the efforts uh, uh, supported efforts to stamp them out. Uh, but he had a friend and who was also a cousin by the name of Pierre uh, Robert, and Calvin became conflicted in his conscience because here is one who is sympathizing with the unit, uh, with the, uh, the gospelers, and with that particular movement. And this caused great consternation to him, and he was very... Uh, I want to say an emotional person, but he was a, a very introspective person in this regard. Uh, we mentioned about the fact that he didn't think he had free will. This has a lot to do with his personality. Uh, and, and thinking about, should he turn his cousin in and watch him burn at the stake, or should he more, learn more about what is motivating him to, toward Luther's uh, uh, doctrine and, and toward that movement, and, and learn more about that? And, of course, he chose to do uh, the second, and there are circumstances that led him to do that. One night while he was uh, studying, and uh, he uh, left uh, the library and the uh, campus, he was on his way back to his apartment, and he was suddenly approached and grabbed by an old man uh, who reportedly asked him if he had heard of God's free gift. And of course, again, being raised in Catholicism, everything was works-based, so this was something new to him. He struggled, he broke away from the old man, didn't want to be seen with him, and, and especially didn't want, would, want the authorities to see him in the company of somebody who had Reformation ideology. Uh, so he went back to his lodgings, and he didn't really dwell on the incident, but about a week later, uh, he noticed a crowd that was gathering during the day, and he drew closer to see what was happening, and the same old man who had approached him and grabbed him and asked him about God's free gift, had he heard about it, he was being burned at the stake for heresy. But Calvin was impressed and struck by the old man's calm demeanor while being burned. And he was singing while he was being burned a mighty fortress, which had been written by uh, Martin Luther. And as the flames were consuming his body, this stirred a great deal of emotion up in Calvin. And again, I think this speaks to the tenderness of this man's uh, personality as well. And of course, uh, he, at this particular time, he was also writing a commentary on Seneca's uh, work concerning judicial clemency. Now, he was a first century Stoic who had written about the way that the Romans were treating uh, Christians and treating uh, those uh, and the, the horrendous public executions that took place during his day. And of course, Seneca took the uh, position that it was counterproductive to do that 
uh, in, the, in the first century, and that there should be a place for clemency and mercy, that such would have a better effect upon the Roman world. And in this commentary, he, he questioned the uh, Roman Catholic approach to enforcing orthodoxy, and no doubt, having just witnessed the cruelty of burning a, a, a harmless old man, if you will, while he was writing this work, it stirred his position for clemency even further. And his own writings indicate the internal, internal conflict that he was going through at this time. Now, this is what Calvin wrote about this situation. He said, Being exceedingly alarmed at the misery into which I have fallen, and much more at that which threatened me in view of eternal death, I, duty-bound, made it my first business to betake myself to your way, condemning my past life, and of course, talking uh, your way would be God's way, not without groans and tears. He said, And now, O Lord, as if it were a prayer of... He said, what remains to a wretch like me, but instead of defense, earnestly to supplicate you uh, not to judge that fearful abandonment of your word according to its deserts, from which in your wonderful goodness you have at last delivered me. So this was something that, that preyed upon his mind and, and something that caused him to uh, look differently at Catholicism. In fact, uh, it's also stated here that he said, uh, he wrote, God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters that might have been expected from me at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so, desi so intense a desire to make progress therein. He said that although I did not altogether leave off other studies, I pursued them with less ardor. And, of course, remember, he had graduated with a law degree, but he decided at that point, and what he witnessed, that spurred him to, to uh, become a reformer. He also had a friend by the name of Nicholas Kopp. Uh, Nicholas Kopp was a highly esteemed scholar and philosopher. He was also, again, a close friend of him, Calvin, at this time. He had just been elected the rector of the University of Paris. Now, Cop, because he was just elected as, as this rector, had been uh, required to give a major academic address to the faculty and attendees who would come to hear him. And the address, which took place on November 1st, 1533, turned out to be a defense of Luther's Reformation theology. Now, although the University of Paris was not a Catholic but a free university, the faculty and those in attendance maintained their allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. And here's what happened. Nicholas Kopp had to flee from the stage as he, and, uh, in quite a hurry. And luckily he had a horse waiting for him. I think he knew something was going to happen when he did this. He escaped from Paris on horseback. According to Durant, he said the speech created a furor. The Suborn, which was the audience, uh, auditorium in which he uh, gave this speech, erupted in anger. The parliament began proceedings against Kopp for heresy. And he fled, and, and a reward of 300 crowns was offered for his capture, alive or dead. And what is, I would say, humorous about this is the fact that it was soon discovered that Calvin had a hand in preparing that speech and uh, presented by Kopp, and therefore he had to flee Paris as well. So he became a fugitive. And as a fugitive, uh, uh, we find Kopp went to Basel, Switzerland. Now, Calvin was not able to escape as quickly. He did not have an escape route planned. Uh, and so he hid out in France for about a year with a, a friend by the name of Gerard Roussel, a reformer who had the ear of Marguerite of Navarre, who was the king, uh, the sister rather, of King Francis I. And while he was in France, he found refuge in uh, Agulim, uh, which, and that's where he began to write his institutes uh, in the rich library of Louis de Tillet. And, uh, and of course, uh, he also returned to Noyon to return finances uh, to those supporting his education, the Montmores. So he, he did the right thing. He, he decided not to pursue the priesthood and, and, and was returning uh, that which they had invested in him. And he, he, when he was in Noyon, he was actually arrested twice but he was also freed twice. When he returned to Paris, he met with Protestant leaders where he met Michael Servetus, who would later be burned at the stake while in Geneva. 
Now, I, I mention these things because, again, this, all these events taking place had somewhat to do with what formed and, and shaped this man's theology. Uh, now, he was able to join uh, Cop in, uh, in 1536 in Basel, uh, Switzerland, and he, there he completed his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, and actually, it did better uh, publication-wise than De Clementia, which he had written based upon Seneca's uh, call for clemency. And uh, it's interesting that he, when he wrote this, he actually addressed it to the most Christian king of France. And, uh, and of course, uh, I guess in buttering him up in a way, but encouraging him to be more understanding, that is the king uh, of France, more understanding of what was going on with the the Reformation uh, at this time. And uh, it's, it, the book actually sold out within a year. It was initially published in Latin, which he had become adept to, and it sold out within a year. The next edition was an enlarged version. It was published in Latin also in 1539. The edition was also published in French in, in, uh, in 14, uh, 1541. And the Parliament of Paris gathered copies of the book in both languages and burned them publicly in the capital. So he was not looked upon in a good way. Now, he briefly returned back to France, uh, but there, there was an edict that was set forth by the king of France called the Edict de Calci, and it was in force, and it withheld punishment on Protestants if they denounced their ways, denounced their loyalty to the Reformation way. Uh, and, of course, he then came to Farrar, where he met... Uh, Rene of Farrar. He worked there for about six months as a secretary. So he's always on, he's on the run in, in this regard. And, uh, and she leaned toward the Reformation, but it was not until talking to Calvin that she had a better understanding of the Reformation. Uh, then we have him coming to Geneva. And, and this is a, a very interesting uh, part of his life because he was actually there moving on to somewhere else. They actually spent the night there. And apparently, the, the institutes had made a, such an inroad into, uh, because of the print and press and, other, and, uh, and it was spread about, that somehow he was recognized by somebody going into a place of lodging in Geneva. Now, Geneva had actually decided to go along with the Reformation. And, uh, and the people, were, uh, though, that were there coming to Geneva had a distorted understanding of what the Reformation meant, the principles of it. And they, were, they went by the name of the Libertines. And of course, if, if you've heard the Libertines in history, these were individuals that when they saw that uh, breaking away from Catholicism, they were being taught that uh, they felt uh, the idea of salvation by faith alone, and they felt uh, they, they took it to, lo it to its logical end, that they chose lives of uh, licentious and debauchery and drunkenness and sexual immorality. So we also, they had also created a sort of red light district in Geneva. But there was a Reformation uh, leader there by the name of William Farrell, and he found out that, uh, that Calvin was in town, and he actually went to where he was. He knocked on the door and, uh, in, in the middle of the night and talked to Calvin about staying there. And uh, it was not Calvin's desire to do that. Because of his personality, very inward person, very uh, reticent uh, uh, from what I've been able to read uh, concerning him, uh, he pointed out that he was not suited for that kind of work, to be, to be a leader in that way. He just wanted a quiet place where he could sit and write. And this is the response that Calvin gave to Pharaoh. He said Pharaoh would take no, would, uh, that he would not take no for an answer, and Calvin would later write the following about his conversation with him. He said, Then Pharaoh, who was working with incredible zeal to promote the gospel, bent all his efforts to keep me in the city. And again, remember, he was just there to stay so he could move on. Uh, and when he realized that I was determined to study in privacy in some obscure place and saw that he gained nothing by entreaty, he descended by cursing and said that God would surely curse my peace if I held back from giving help at a time of such great need. Notice what he said. Again, this speaks to his personality. He said, terrified by his words and conscience 
uh, conscious of my own timidity and cowardice, I gave up my journey and attempted to apply whatever gift I had in defense of my faith. And of course, so he decided to stay in Geneva. Now, I say more about what's going on in, in Geneva, but let's just say it did not work out very well for Calvin. In fact, uh, uh, after coming back from the city of Lucene where they had a, a, a city citywide meeting as to whether or not that city was going to go with the Reformation or stay with Catholicism, uh, we find that he came back uh, to uh, Geneva with Pharaoh, and he stayed for two years, the most miserable two years of his life, as he would uh, uh, indicate. The influence of the Libertines was growing, and they hated Calvin's uh, teaching regarding public decency and morality. But again, if you teach that you are at the whims of circumstances, how are you going to say, uh, hey, you ought to control your urges and control this, uh, if, if you are at the behest of everything that goes on around you. Uh, he was ridiculed. He became a laughingstock of the city. He gained a reputation of being a hyper-moralist who spent his time searching the streets for sinful people. And one of the things that happened to him, according to what I've been able to read, he was hit by the contents of tra chamber pots as he traversed the town. Imagine people throwing their chamber pots, and we know what's in chamber pots. Uh, but he, uh, this is what he went through while he was there. And when I read that while ago, when he had gone to Strasbourg, and, and while he was there, he was under the tutelage of Mar Martin Bucher and also Philip uh, Melanchthon. And, and, of course, Strasbourg is in Germany. And these were associates of uh, Martin Luther. But while he was there, it was a peaceful time for him. And he uh, actually began to write again. He updated and wrote a second edition of his uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion. He wrote a commentary on Romans at that time while he was there. He also uh, was married. And it's interesting that one of the reasons why he did marry, he said concerning marriage, he had written, I who have an air of being so hostile to celibacy, I am still not married and do not know whether I will ever be. If I take a wife, it will be because... Being better freed from numerous worries, I can devote myself to the Lord. And one thing that uh, we, I learned about him is the fact that this guy did not take care of himself. He, he studied a lot. He did not eat properly and, and did not take care of himself. One historian says that his health was poor, that he was not perhaps a good manager of his own affairs, and his impatience and irritability uh, would be softened by marriage. Uh, a historian by the name of Peterson said that. And, of course, so he ended up, while he was in uh, Strasbourg, uh, marrying the widow of a man th that he had actually converted over from the Anabaptist. Uh, and, and uh, of course, uh, he, as he passed away and, and some time transpired after that, that uh, he ended up marrying uh, Idolette de uh, Buris Stordeau. And, uh, and, of course, uh, again... Uh, we, uh, as far as the pronunciation goes, uh, that's uh, how it would go. But uh, Bucher suggested that Calvin consider her as a prospective bride, and he did, and he ended up marrying her. And of course then, and this is what I read a while ago, uh, at the beginning of this lesson, that he, when he said that I had, if I had free choice, because the people in Geneva, the, the town council, uh, came to Strasbourg and tried to encourage him to come back to Geneva. And apparently th things had improved. That the Libertines were not as uh, adamant and, and in control of things as they once were. And they thought that he could do a good work there as far as that goes. His, his writings had been uh, circulated and uh, he was gaining a, a reputation of one in, in the ref as the reformers. And uh, although he did not want to go back, even Martin Bucher of, of, uh, of Strasbourg and even his wife, took this visit as a call of God for him to return to Geneva. But again, this attitude that he had, if I had free choice, I would prefer to do anything else in the world. He had a choice. He just, his theology was that he was again at the whims of whatever circumstances and requests that were being made of him, that God was behind all of this. Now he returned uh, for a visit. He did not bring Idolette or her uh, uh, children at that time. Uh, and upon his return, he was showered with gifts. He was given a new robe, a black velvet, he, which was trimmed with fur and given a house to live in. And 
on uh, Rue de Chinois, uh, which was a narrow street near the cathedral and had a, a lake in the back and uh, had a garden and all these things that they used in order to entice him to come back. And of course, they, he decided to do so. And uh, then the city council sent a uh, two-horse carriage to Strasbourg to collect Idolette, the, the children had, uh, and uh, all the family furniture to bring back to Geneva. And, uh, and of course, what happened after that, we, we could call that a tragedy. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, she was in poor health, uh, the fact that she uh, died at a young age while still in her 30s, she began to waste away due to a disease, most likely tuberculosis. In August of 1548, he wrote that she is so overpowered with her sickness that she can scarcely support herself or, or stand or uh, do anything. And, and again, she was a young woman. She uh, uh, just, uh, just reaching her late 30s uh, when she became ill. And of course, uh, uh, we find that he told her as she was near death, three days before her death, that, uh, that he would care for uh, the children, and of course, they were his stepchildren at that time, and so, uh, and so, and that was something that she said. I know that you would not neglect that for which you have been entrusted, which has been entrusted to God. And uh, again, that, this shows again the tenderness of this individual to to let her know that as she died, that they would be cared for. Uh, but then we think about the conform, the reforms that he had in Geneva. And I know my time is. Uh, uh, limited and some of the things that he did and and again we have to understand that here is Calvin uh, that uh, again raised in this ecclesiastical city he all he knew from youth was the the thumb of the Roman Catholic Church and everybody's affairs if you will everybody's pies I guess you could say and that uh, breaking away from that and and learning uh, under the influence of uh, some Renaissance people and and uh, and the the Lutheran influence that uh, that he became in contact with. And uh, then he came to, uh, back to Geneva. And while he was in Geneva, he made some reforms. And, uh, and again, this was at the behest of the city council. Uh, among the, those reforms had to do with offices. And although they were, Geneva was committed to the Reformation, it was pretty chaotic and in need of, in, in need of spiritual leadership. He sought to bring some order to the infrastructure of how the church operated there. So uh, imagine they broken, broken away from Catholicism, but they were in shambles as far as any type of organization. Again, he did not go back to the New Testament church. And that, that is uh, something that uh, he uh, failed in doing so. But again, it was more as was pointed out this morning by Brother, uh, Brother Mike, that it was a, a reaction uh, and an overreaction to some degree to what was happening in Catholicism. Uh, became, he became known as the uh, architect of the Presbyterian form of church government. And of course, this had to, uh, by charting a new course of church government, Calvin, uh, he sought to avoid a democratic rule on one hand and a hierarchical system that one would find in the Roman Catholic Church. He was trying to find a happy medium in between that. And in this governance, the authority would reside in the offices rather than in the persons. Now, think about that. Uh, if it resides in the office, then whoever is in that office only has authority as long as they're in that office. One of the problems I had in Catholicism that you would have people that would become ensconced in those particular positions and be power hungry on top of that and, and become very corrupt and, and, and be very corrupt in that desire. Uh, to do that. Uh, but these offices, uh, again, they would serve their terms, they would be replaced. And this included the following offices, and, and this is uh, in the research I've done, he, uh, pastors, doctors, elders, and deacons. And of course, uh, we understand that the Bible makes no distinction between a pastor and an elder, uh, that a, a pastor uh, is just another word to describe the work of the elder, as far as being a, a shepherd. And, of course, the elders referring to uh, presbyteros having to do with the, the wisdom and experience that comes with age in that regard. In regard to court, uh, the, this church judiciary would handle matters of church discipline. And one of the things that he sought to do uh, was put rules in place that would limit the discipline to excommunication uh, for the purpose of effecting repentance on the part of the subject. 
He objected to inquisitions. He objected, uh, objected to torture and the burning at the stake, and of course, which had taken place. Now, later on, when we run into a fellow by the name of Michael Servetus, uh, there was an exception there. But even in that point, uh, he, he wanted, uh, it to be, uh, wanted it to be a quick death rather than a, a, a death that was going to be cruel. And we think about Michael Servetus, and uh, I'm going to be running out of time here, but uh, this was an individual, and if you read concerning Calvin and him, and there are a lot of individuals that blame the death of, of Servetus on Calvin, that he did not defend him, and that he actually went against his idea of court having to do with uh, excommunication, where, but uh, he, this guy actually came out uh, as an unabashed heretic, uh, considering the things that he taught. Uh, he was one of, born of Spanish, uh, lower Spanish um, nobility. He was educated and skilled in medicine, languages, and theology. In 1531, he wrote a book called On the Errors of the Trinity. And he wrote it anonymously because if the Catholic Church knew who wrote it, he would have been killed at that time, burned at the stake. But he left his identity undiscovered. He did not want to be known. Uh, he taught mathematics and astrology at the uh, University of Paris. He became a doctor of medicine in 1539. He practiced medicine for about 10 years in Vienne, France. Now, during this time, he was also communicating with Calvin. Now, he, this, this tells you how deceptive this individual was. He, he came across as an inquisitive person desiring to learn his Calvin's position on a number of spiritual matters. However, as time went on, the tone of those letters changed. Uh, they grew to evidence of vitriol and sarcasm, and Calvin ceased uh, writing him as a result of that. Now, he continued and actually published another work that not only attacked the doctrine of the Trinity, and of course the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, but also personally attacked and ridiculed Calvin himself. Now, he knew that the French Catholics hated Calvin. And he thought that if he threw some insults about Calvin into this particular work, that that would kind of let him off the hook for his anti-Trinitarian views. But he was sadly mistaken. He was actually convicted of heresy in Vienne where he was, and he was sentenced to burn at the stake, and not only burn at the stake, but to do so slowly. In other words, they, they wanted him to really suffer. And what's interesting about this, the, the Libertines in uh, Geneva caught wind of this, and apparently they had some influence. Now, they, maybe their influence in that city had lessened uh, since Calvin had gotten there, but they learned about his situation, and they arranged through a series of well-placed bribes for Servetus to be released and to, and to be brought to Geneva. And their intention was to use him as a pawn to embarrass and ridicule Calvin, because Calvin had had some uh, correspondence with this individual, but also the fact that this individual was, uh, Servetus was uh, very uh, critical of Calvin, uh, thought that that might be something that uh, they could use against Calvin. Well, uh, Servetus was allowed to come to uh, Geneva. In fact, he was welcome as long as he did not attack or slander accepted Orthodox teachings, such as the Trinity or their spiritual leader at this time, John Calvin. Now, Liberty's their end in having him there would not be served if, if he kept his mouth shut. And one thing we learned about Servetus is that he, he liked attention. Uh, so they manipulated events in such a way that he showed his true colors, he broke these conditions, and he was arrested, tried, and convicted of open public heresy. And of course, Calvin, although he was not involved in the civil matter and did not attend the trial, the prosecutor did ask Calvin about some uh, legal points because he was a lawyer. He was, he was sentenced to be burned at the stake, the standard punishment for heresy at the time. And again, uh, it's interesting that he wrote a letter to the city council uh, asking for clemency on behalf of Servetus, requesting that instead of having a long drawn out burning at the stake, uh, for him to be beheaded, that that would be uh, clemency. So he still requested his life, but Again, he, he was burnt, but he was burned at the stake after that request was denied. And then we have his final years in uh, Geneva. And I had to skip quite a bit to get through this material, and I appreciate uh, the patience. And if you follow along in the book, you probably wonder where I'm at, but 
uh, in the ninth point here, uh, his final years in Geneva, uh, the libertine element had faded from Geneva by 1555. Uh, they had seen that the city council and the, the growing respect for, for Calvin, the fact that they had asked him to come back, the fact that Servetus, who they were going to use as a pawn to embarrass uh, Calvin, that upon his death, their influence greatly waned. And maybe it was also discovered that they were behind uh, him coming there and, and, uh, and causing trouble. But it solidified the desire of the city council to maintain a spiritual purity, which was not conducive to their ongoing aims of licentiousness and debauchery. And, of course, with that lifestyle, uh, you usually end up uh, uh, conducting yourself with behavior that ends your life shortly anyway in other ways. But with the Libertines gone, he was able to implement a number, implement a number of reforms in the city. And, uh, and of course, during this particular time, uh, there was in England, we find that Mary Tudor, called Bloody Mary, was uh, persecuting uh, those involved with the reform movement uh, in England. And so this city of Geneva welcomed them uh, as far as, uh, as a place of refuge, welcomed those that were... Uh, leaving uh, England at that time. And uh, in fact, Mary, uh, uh, when we look at the political situation there, the daughter of King Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon desired uh, to return to England from the, from the Anglican Church back to Roman Catholicism. And this is where the vigorous persecution of, uh, against Protestants took place. Uh, to set an example, she burned some 300 men women and children at the stake. Many of them left as a result. Geneva was among the cities taking in these refugees. And of course, when uh, Elizabeth came back to the English throne in 1558, they went back to England. Elizabeth was friendly toward the Protestant movement. Mary, a bloody Mary, was not. Uh, and of course, they had been greatly influenced by the teachings of Calvin during their stay. They went back to England. Uh, they, the Anglican form was not up to uh, the standards of what they had learned while they were in Geneva. And these individuals sought to purify the Church of England. They were disparaging referred, uh, disparaging referred to as Puritans. And of course, we, I think we all have heard of that as far as a historical name was concerned. He also sent, and as, as he trained 100 missionaries back to France, and uh, the, they were known as Huguenots. Uh, the Huguenot movement in France uh, referred to this effort to convert Catholic France to the Protestant Reformation. And most of these missionaries sent to France uh, from Geneva paid with their lives, knowing even ahead of time that it was probably going to cost them their lives, and this was a suicide mission of sorts. And then have further information about what Calvin continued to do in Geneva, that he founded a, an elementary and advanced schools which took in students regardless of their ability and their families to pay. They were called con common schools. Uh, he advised that the church, not the state, should be sponsoring these schools so that those who could not pay should, would not be hinder hindered from them becoming, uh, becoming literate in the Bible and learning other skills. Within five years, 1,500 students attended these schools in Geneva. And the elementary school later became known as uh, College Calvin and was a college prep school in Geneva. And, of course, the other school, the advanced school, became the University of Geneva. And, of course, uh, and now John Knox, who uh, was actually a, a native of Scotland, was uh, an individual that actually uh, uh, visited uh, Calvin uh, d around this time. And and uh, was greatly influenced uh, by Calvin and took many of the ideas back. Of course, we'll talk about that uh, on, on Wednesday. Uh, Calvin ended up uh, passing on May 27, 1564, at the age of 54 years, a young man. But we have to understand the life expectancy at that time was not that great anyway. When you think about uh, the diet, think about the disease and other things to, to take into account, things that were not known. Uh, that, uh, and especially when we think about uh, Calvin and the way he treated himself, what was even said by historians about why he needed to get married because he was not taking care of himself. But Theodore Beza would write the following concerning his life and passing, that he was buried with no gravestone at his request, according to a historian by the name of Ryan Reeves, stated that he wanted an unmarked grave. 
Uh, he lived 54 years, 7 months, and 10 days. Half of it he spent in the ministry. He was of moderate statue, pale and dark com with dark complexion, with eyes that sparkled to the moment of his death. And this is somebody that loved him, so he it writes very glowingly about him. Uh, like, uh, you know, like uh, Guyton was very glowing about me, and I appreciate that. But it says, in his dress, he was <laughs> said he was neither careful nor mean, which became his singular modesty. In diet, he was moderate, being, notice he said, equally adverse to sordidness or luxury. He was most sparingly in quantity, and for many years taking only one meal a day on account of the weakness of his stomach. He took little sleep. He had such an astonishing memory that any person whom he had seen once he instantly recognized at a distance of, uh, of many years. He was not absent-minded, and whatever he did, he was quite present, clear, and correct. Pope Pius had this comment about him, and I, I find this to be rather humorous, even though he may not have meant it as such. But he commented concerning Calvin in this manner. He said, the strength of that heretic consisted in this that money never had the slightest charm for him. If I had such servants, my kingdom would extend from sea to sea. That's what Pope Pius uh, IV said concerning him. So when we think about, and, and again, and statements have been made in regard to the fact that these, uh, the reformers, they did not go far enough, and that, is, that certainly is the case. And even when we think about Calvin, and again, the the way in which he was raised in a, an ecclesiastical city, and I mentioned that at the onset of this, the fact that once he moved away from that works-based religion, even to the extent that he did an overreach in the other direction, uh, we recognize that here's an individual that, uh, that had, even with a good heart, that uh, his, his understanding was not as complete as it needed to be, and we understand that to be the case. The fact that he had such a tender personality that he thought he, he was, again, carried by circumstances and whims and that allowed himself to be controlled by those without, uh, and without uh, standing up for himself in that regard. Uh, we find that uh, this played a lot into his personality. And, of course, as we come to the end of this, and this is, uh, uh, we want to indicate, and the, the political contributions uh, that were made, the idea of the separation of church and state, uh, he is referred to by Presbyterians as the inventor of America. According to Lorraine Baltner, it says, so intense, universal, and aggressive were the Presbyterians in their zeal for liberty that the war was often spoken of in England as the Presbyterian Rebellion. And that had a lot to do with, again, this attitude of breaking away that independence, fierce independent spirit that came not only from Calvin, but also his influences upon Knox in Scotland. Uh, and, w and this is a statement that was made in Parliament, and I'll, I'll close with this. He said, with the news of these extraordinary proceedings, when it reached England, Prime Minister Horace Walpole said in Parliament, Cousin America has run off with a Presbyterian parson. Uh, the Reverend, and of course this is in the quote here, Dr. John Witherspoon, who is a native of Scotland, a lineal descent of John Knox, was in the revolutionary time the president of Princeton uh, College, and he was the only clerical member of the Revolutionary Congress. He also signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so we, we think about the widespread, and, and again, we, when we talk about TULIP and the the perversion that comes from his misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches about man and his relationship to God, that, that religion is based on a whosoever will uh, concept and not God has chosen us to either be saved or lost from the beginning of time. Uh, we, we see that, uh, uh, again, he did not go far enough, went too far in some other things, but uh, we recognize the fact that here was a man of great conviction that had he maybe been in different circumstances and, and his zeal for the truth was in a different way, maybe he would have gone in a, a different direction. But we, we do understand that, uh, that the religious world, for the most part, holds to some type of Calvinistic uh, teaching. And even the, the idea that has, are, is going to be talked about in other uh, lessons, but it was my in, uh, intent to talk about Calvin himself, talk about the man, talk about his frailties, talk about the things that made him who he was. And these other lessons will deal with 
uh, many of the things that he taught. But I appreciate your attention and thank you for listening.